can be easy to overlook history, especially here in Florida with Disney, Daytona, the beaches, and sporting events. But a lot of what happened here would go on to not only shape our country, but our army as well. I'm Scott Wilkins, and I'm standing along the banks of the Withlacoochee River. Hard river to say, even harder to cross, as the U.S. Army will come to find out in the year 1836. A lot of the fighting that year took place along this river in what is known as the Second Seminole War. But America's attention would be not on what happened here in Florida, but what was happening in Texas and their fight for independence. But this river would be crucial, and the Second Seminole War would prove to be vital. And it would all start on December 28, 1835. On that date, the Seminoles would launch simultaneous attacks against two American forces, with the Dade Massacre and the attack on Fort King, which would result in the death of Indian agent Wiley Thompson and his aide, Lieutenant Constantine Smith. Duncan Lamont Clinch, commanding general of fall forces in Florida, was not aware of the events that had transpired and set out on his own to forcibly remove the Seminoles. Joined by Territorial Governor and Military General Richard Call and 500 volunteers, he departed Fort Drain toward the Seminole home known as the Cove. The 750-man army would arrive along the Withlacoochee River on New Year's Eve, 1835. It was imperative that Clinch and his men have some form of success along this river, but many of the enlistments would expire at the beginning of the new year, but they were underprepared and underestimated their opponent. One of the soldiers had spotted a canoe on the far side of the river, and after swimming over to get it, Clinch began ferrying his forces to the other side piecemeal. Roughly 200 soldiers had made it across, but with no orders to do anything, they just sat around waiting. The Seminoles had been watching, and slowly crept in closer. Eventually, a soldier spotted them, and raised the alarm. The two sides began exchanging fire, and Clinch finally decided to build a bridge to cross the river. On the far side, Lt. Col. Fanning, who was commanding the volunteers, requested to lead a bayonet charge. Fanning was a West Point graduate who had fought in the War of 1812, where he had lost one arm, and in the First Seminole War. He was a fiery character, to be sure. Three bayonet charges were unsuccessful, but a fourth proved to be the one that changed the battle. By this point, the bridge across the river was completed, and the men who had crossed by canoe made their way back across the river, and the bridge was dismantled. In just about an hour of fighting, four soldiers were dead, and 59 were wounded, to three Seminole dead, and five wounded, although Clinch would later claim that 30 had been killed. General Clinch and Governor Call were unsuccessful and made their way back to Fort Drain. There, they were met with the news of Major Dade and Agent Wiley Thompson's death. That made their defeat even worse. When the War Department found out about the events of December, they weren't happy, and they tasked General Winfield Scott with prosecuting the war to a successful conclusion. Scott was a veteran of the War of 1812, but would go on to even greater acclaim in 10 years' time with the Mexican-American War. But before he could get to lead the war effort, his chief rival and commander of the Southwest District, Edmund P. Gaines, would beat him to it. Gaines would land a force at Fort Brook and march north following Dade's path from two months prior. In his haste to avenge American losses, he neglected Scott's orders to return to New Orleans and leave Florida alone. On February 20th, they came across the Dade Massacre site. And according to Henry Prince, a lieutenant in the Army who would eventually become a Union general in the Civil War, it was a dreadful scene, and the bodies were so badly decayed, it was unknown who had been scalped. They buried the dead and kept marching to Fort King, arriving on February 22nd. They then marched west to the Withlacoochee. The army would arrive here on February 24th, 1836, where the river makes a sea. Gaines would attempt to cross here, but he would never be able to as the Seminoles would ambush them immediately. For the second time in two months, an American army was unable to cross the Withlacoochee River. Recognizing the need for protection, Gaines ordered a log breastwork to be built with earthen bastions. The first casualty of the fighting would be Lieutenant Izzard, whom the small fortification would be named after. A letter was immediately sent to General Clinch at Fort Drain, but there was no response. The Seminoles surrounded the fortification and continued to fire intermittently. Again, Gaines would request help from Clinch, and again there would be no relief. As the rations diminished, the troops were forced to eat horses and dogs. Eventually, Gaines determined to negotiate with the Seminoles in order to get his army out safely. But just as this was about to happen, General Clinch and a number of soldiers arrived to lift the siege after eight days. The Americans had suffered five killed and 46 wounded, to seminal losses of three killed and five wounded. Yet again, an American army was soundly beaten by Osceola, who was proving he knew how to fight, and the Seminoles would not go quietly. Gaines would retreat from the river and return to Louisiana. He would leave behind an encouraged group of Seminole warriors and a demoralized American army in his rear. Clearly, the beginning of the Second Seminole War was not going well, and more than one person was taking note. After three months of fighting, General Winfield Scott had finally arrived in Florida and set up a supply depot outside Jacksonville and Picolata. 
His plan called for three armies to march simultaneously to the Seminole headquarters at the Cove. The first of these armies would be led by Abraham Eustace, a lawyer and a veteran of the War of 1812, who departed St. Augustine with 1,400 volunteers on March 15th. He would struggle to cross the St. John's River, but after finally marching through Okahumka and burning Abrahamstown to the ground, his army marched south toward Fort Brooke. The second wing departed Fort Brooke on March 21st, led by Colonel William Lindsay and 1,200 soldiers, mostly from Alabama and Louisiana. His army made its way to the Coahoochee River, but after receiving no word from Scott or Eustace, he returned back to Fort Brooke on April 4th, leaving Scott all by himself. The third wing would be led by Scott himself and General Clinch, again departing Fort Drain, this time with 2,000 men. They would stop at the old location at Camp Izzard, where they camped for the night. For some reason, in his infinite wisdom, Scott thought it would be a good idea to have the band play music while they ate. Two men ended up getting killed in the skirmish that ensued. That morning, they would follow the river south. Little did they know, they were being watched the entire time. As the army moved south, Osceola instructed his warriors to harass Scott's army, but not to engage it. In an attempt to ambush, the Seminoles tried to attack Scott's column, but were driven off multiple times by the accompanying cannon. Having not met with the Seminoles in any force, Scott proceeded south toward Fort Brooke. But before doing so, he left Major Mark Anthony Cooper with the sick and wounded and ordered him to establish a fort until his return. Fort Cooper was a square palisaded fort with two redoubts and a two-story blockhouse. Major Cooper and his 300 men of the 1st Georgia Battalion were left alone for three days, at which point they were discovered by the Seminoles. The soldiers were under constant fire and held off a force of 500 Seminoles, who tried to storm the fort. After 16 days, General Scott returned to relieve Fort Cooper. In the two weeks of fighting, only 20 men were wounded, and one soldier, Private Zadok Cook, was killed. Fort Cooper would not see any action the rest of the Seminole War, but in an interesting tidbit of history, it would be used by Confederate soldiers during the Civil War until it was captured by Union soldiers in February of 1864. General Scott would be recalled barely six months into managing the Florida campaign. He would go on to deal with the Creek Indians and a court of inquiry into the failed campaigns of 1836. But the year was not over, and that left things a little bit dicey, as Richard Call would be the de facto military head in Florida for a time being. In November, he wanted to avenge the earlier fiasco along the Withlacoochee River. Together with a force of Army regulars, Tennessee volunteers, Florida militia, and friendly Creek warriors, a force of 1,830 marched the 33 miles from Fort Drain to the river over a span of three days. Once at the river, he did the unthinkable and divided his forces in an attempt to sweep the neighboring hammocks. Four days into the march, on November 17th, Colonel Alexander Bradford and the 1st Regiment of Tennessee Mounted Volunteers charged into a hammock, forcing the Seminoles to flee. Casualties were reported as one killed and 10 wounded, to 20 killed and many wounded for the Seminoles. The next day, on the east side of the river, Captain Truesdale with the 1st and 2nd Regiments of Tennessee Volunteers, roughly 550 soldiers in total, battled in a nearby hammock with between 6 and 700 Seminoles. Casualties were 3 killed and 15 wounded, to 25 killed, and an unknown number wounded for the Seminoles. The two forces rejoined on the west side of the river and continued south. They soon discovered a new Seminole position. On the east side of the river, but in order to get there, they needed to cross it. Major David A. Moniak, the first Native American to graduate West Point and commander of Creek Volunteers, waded into the water to check the depth and was killed instantly. Nothing ever came of this third encounter, and taken all together, these three battles would be the Battle of Wahoo Swamp. It was along this mighty river that Major Moniak and four others would lose their lives in an attempt to defeat the Seminoles once and for all. General Call would return back to Fort Drain, where he'd be relieved of command on December 9, 1836, by Major General Thomas Jessup. The American War would continue for another seven years, but it all started in 1836. In 1842, the war would finally come to an end, but no peace was ever signed. The Seminoles were never conquered. Unfortunately, there's not too much remaining from these battlefields, and this video was shot mostly at Fort Cooper State Park. There are some markers along the Withlacoochee State Trail, such as this one for the Battle of Wahoo Swamp, but it is definitely worth checking out both the Fort Cooper State Park and the Withlacoochee River. Thanks for watching my video. Please like and subscribe and leave a comment. Also, check out my other videos on my YouTube channel and look for more videos coming soon.
It was imperative that Clinch and his men... Whatever. General Clinch and Governor Call made their way back to Fort Drain after their unsuccessful attempt. They were met with a... Uh, 